Welcome to the program. Glad to be with you as always. We face three planetary dangers, the pandemic, the climate crisis, and the use of nuclear weapons that would terminate life on Earth. About the latter, if Putin is trapped in a corner, he may make a desperate move and or one of the six Ukrainian nuclear reactors could be bombed either deliberately or by accident. Historically, has there ever been a moment like this? The fate of the planet is in the hands of Putin, Zelensky, Biden, Secretary of State Anthony Blinken, and National Security Advisor Jake Sullivan. Frankly, I'm very worried. I don't know what keeps you up at night. But what can people do in this scenario? Same as always, it's a dangerous scenario. We can work to try to influence what's within our range of influence. You and I can't affect uh, the policies uh, dictate, de decided by the Kremlin. Nothing we can do about that. We can do a fair amount about U.S. policy. So, for example, uh, uh, the United States happens to be uh, diverging right now pretty sharply from most of the world with regard to this crucial issue, and we can work to try to change that policy. That's uh, hard, but not impossible. Uh, most of the world overwhelmingly wants to move directly to negotiations to try to end the horrors in Ukraine before they get even worse. It's true of the global south, major countries of the south, uh, India, Indonesia, China, Africa, overwhelmingly. It's true of most of Europe and Germany major country in Europe, uh, over three quarters of the population want to move to uh, negotiations right away. Slovakia, another industrial country, uh, even larger proportion. Uh, we don't have polls from the other countries, but I suspect it's mostly the same. So that's one point of view. The US and Britain are standing out their position, and formally, is that the U.S. that the war must continue in order to severely weaken Russia, uh, and uh, that means no negotiations, of course. Well, we can work to bring the United States into conformity with most of the world, and maybe uh, avert worse catastrophes. Maybe. I don't see anything else that we can do, but that's more than enough of a task. Fascism is more than in the air. Uh, it's mentioned by Ralph Nader, who said, we're seeing American fascism on the rise. Henry Giroux has talked and written about it, as has Chris Hedges. So talk about uh, fascism then and now. You know, it was a century ago, almost exactly, October 1922, that Mussolini seized power in Italy with his march on Rome. Italian fascism emerges a full decade before Hitler comes to power in Germany. And Mussolini said, fascism should more appropriately be called corporatism because it is a merger of state and corporate power. Your comments on the rise of fascism, do you accept the premise? Well, just to be timely, yesterday, as you know, the far-right parties, the main one with neo-fascist origins, uh, took over Italy. So there are reminiscences for me, actually personal reminiscences. I'm old enough to remember the what was happening in the mid-30s, quite conscious of it. And it looked at the time as if the rise of fascism was inexorable. 
uh, Mussolini, uh, Hitler, Austria, Czechoslovakia, Franco Spain, February 1939, which I remember very well, uh, it just seemed it was never going to stop. Uh, at that time, however, the United States was an exception. The United States was moving towards social democracy. Uh, Millet, the 1920s were kind of similar to today. The labor movement had been crushed, practically didn't exist. Woodrow Wilson's Red Scare had smashed the vibrant U.S. labor movement, uh, crushed independent thought, uh, uh, sent uh, 4,000 uh, dissidents out of the country, expelled them. Uh, it was a period of business triumphalism, enormous inequality, very much like today, uh, great excitement about uh, the wonderful uh, future run by American business. Uh, uh, then came the Depression, 1929, Next couple of years, very deep poverty and misery, much worse than today. But the labor movement revived. It was industrial organizing, CIO organizing, militant labor action, sit down strikes. Political organizations were lively, a lot of publications. There was a sympathetic administration, which made a huge difference. Uh, out of that came the early steps of what came to be social democracy in much of the world, in Europe after the war. So that was then. Now it's almost the reverse. Uh, the United States is leading the way to a kind of proto-fascism. Uh, Europe is kind of hanging on to elements of social democracy, though they're under attack. Uh, and uh, it's not the 30s, but uh, enough reminiscence to make it feel severely unpleasant. Uh, the uh, sign of what may be the future, unfortunately, is the conference, uh, two conferences, first in Budapest, then in Dallas, uh, where the main conferences of in Europe, in Budapest, it was the major and far-right parties and movements with neo-fascist origins. It was in Hungary because Hungary as a country is in the lead and leading the way to a kind of Christian nationalist fascism, racist, uh, far right, uh, crushing independent thought, controlling the press, uh, uh, what Orban proudly calls illiberal democracy, everything under state control. Uh, the main star at the conference in Budapest was the American US Conservative Political Action Conference, that's the core of the Republican Party. Uh, Trump was gave a speech, virtual speech, praising Orban, uh, Tucker Carlson, leading TV figure, uh, uh, was overwhelmed by uh, Orban's magnificence. That's the future for the United States. Racist Christian national, right wing Christian nationalism, uh, controlled by state power over independent thought and institutions to control the universities, press, and so on. Then came the conference in Dallas a couple of weeks later, organized by the same conservative political action conference, basically the core of the Republican Party. The uh, leading invited guest, key, keynote speaker, Victor Orban, the guide to the future, uh, much the same kind of rhetoric. We hear it in the Supreme Court. 
ultra-right Supreme Court, the Republican Party is quite openly, nothing secret, preparing the way to try to control and uh, manipulate elections so that they can gain permanent power as a minority proto-fascist party. Uh, they may succeed, if so, it'll lead the way to a kind of proto-fascism in the United States, which can have enormous effects. Uh, there's uh, the second largest power in the Western Hemisphere, Brazil, uh, will have a, an election in a couple of days. Uh, looks like, on, on, according to the polls, Lula, sort of moderate social democrat, will probably win, but uh, Bolsonaro, the far-right candidate, has already following the Trump script. He's announced that if he doesn't win, it's not a legitimate election. The election is faked. He has, there are threats of a military coup. Uh, the business world has already said the large part of it that they'd prefer a military coup to having Lula in power. Uh, the, unlike the United States, the police are firm, pretty firmly in the hands of Bolsonaro in the far right. Uh, the army is, we don't know for sure, but it's a, a lot of the um, top military leadership is supportive of Bolsonaro. We don't know if they would keep to democratic processes as was done in the United States or would go along with the coup. So it's possible he might take power, in which case uh, it's very serious. That would mean, first of all, that the Amazon is finished under, it's not a joke, it's been known for a long, most of the Amazon is in Brazil. The Amazon has been a major carbon sink. It's been understood for a long time that at some point under current trends, uh, the Amazon would turn from a carbon sink to a carbon producer with devastating effects for Brazil and uh, enormous consequences for the entire world. Well, it's beginning to happen much ahead of what was predicted. By now, sectors of the Amazon are already at the turning point. It means it turns into savanna. There's not enough moisture produced to maintain the forest. That could have a horrifying effect on the world. Bolsonaro is a big supporter of illegal logging, mining, agribusiness, wants to accelerate the process of destruction, very much like the Republican Party here. The Republican Party is dedicated to destroying the planet as quickly as possible. They don't put it in those words, but that's the meaning of the policies. Maximize the use of fossil fuels, including the most dangerous of them, eliminate uh, regulations that might mitigate their effect. It's, I'm, I'm not saying anything secret. This is perfectly public. In fact, it's gotten so extreme that the corporate sector, which is really on a roll under this period of savage capitalist proto-fascism, they're now actually organizing to punish corporations that even reveal information about the ecological effect of their uh, investments and development. Not just that they have to stop the activities, they have to stop releasing information about it, otherwise they get punished by Republican state legislatures, which take away the pension funds and so on. That's really a savage capitalism carried to a almost a grotesque uh, extreme. It's only one case, lots of things like that. I mean, you may have seen, probably saw a report a couple of weeks ago 
that one of the, the major uh, oil companies, Conoco Phillips, had made a major discovery. Uh, one of the things that most concerns climate scientists is the uh, melt, sharp, fast melting of the Arctic, much faster, warming much faster than most of the rest of the world. Well, that uh, releases uh, the, uh, the cover of the permafrost. Permafrost contains huge amounts of carbon, uh, starts to melt, carbon goes into the atmosphere, it becomes runaway uh, heating, we we're basically done. Well, ConocoPhillips discovered a way to retard the process by uh, some technique by which they drive rods into the permafrost, which cool it and harden it so it doesn't melt so fast. Great discovery. Why are they doing it? So that they can drill oil more effectively. That's why they're doing it. I mean, it's, it's like a suicide race. It's, uh, and it's happening everywhere. You know, take the Middle East, major fossil fuel producer in the world. We're just a couple, just this last week, a couple of new scientific studies which found that the Middle East is warming far higher than had been predicted, far more rapidly than had been predicted. In fact, it's expected to go up almost 10 degrees Fahrenheit by the end of the century. That's getting close to the level of survivability. Uh, water levels, Mediterranean, Eastern Mediterranean water levels are predicted to rise much faster than was anticipated uh, a meter. Uh, by mid-century, up to two and a half meters by 2100. What happens to the Eastern Mediterranean when the sea level rises two and a half meters? Just imagine. Well, meanwhile, while this is going on, Israel and Lebanon are squabbling over who will have the right to produce more uh, fossil fuels at their maritime border. So while their countries are sinking under the Mediterranean, they're squabbling about who will have the right, the honor to administer the final touch. It's insanity. South Asia, in many ways, even worse. South Asia is already at the level of survivability in places in Pakistan and a uh, large part of the country is underwater from the monsoon rains of a kind that have never happened. Many feet of water. Meanwhile, right nearby, there are huge droughts. Uh, uh, farmers in Rajasthan, the poor, poor areas of India, are trying to survive uh, almost 50 degrees Celsius heat. It's without air conditioners. Less than 10% of the population even has them. And the ones that have them are mostly old fashioned uh, uh, pollution producing ones. Meanwhile, they're developing their nuclear weapon systems so that they can destroy each other in a competition over who will control the diminishing waters of the, uh, uh, on which they both rely as the, as the glaciers melt. It's as if the whole species has gone insane. Meanwhile, persist in the Ukraine war, one of the worst, maybe the worst effect of the Ukraine war is to reverse the limited efforts to deal with climate change and to accelerate rapidly the use of fossil fuels, encourage more fossil fuel production, open up new fields for exploitation, to ensure that it goes on way in the future. Uh, we have a narrow window for survival. So let's close it as far as possible. I mean, that's what it means when US official policy is, let's continue the war to weaken Russia and put off negotiations. That's what it means.
not just increasing the threat of nuclear war, killing Ukrainians, and starving millions of people because the flow of grain and fertilizers is cut, but also race to destruction of organized human life on Earth by maximizing fossil fuels during the brief period when we could curtail it or save ourselves. That's the situation we're now in. Uh, 50 degrees uh, centigrade is 122 degrees uh, Fahrenheit. Temperatures which were reached uh, this past summer in India, in Pakistan, uh, in Iraq, and in other parts of West and South Asia. But uh, dialing back a little bit again to uh, Europe and uh, fascism, uh, recently, and I say this because for as long as I can remember, you know, Sweden has been exalted by the American left as some kind of uh, utopia where wonderful things happen and the government is benevolent and the people are happy, etc. Well, recently, a right wing group founded by neo Nazis became the largest party in Sweden's likely governing coalition. In Germany, there's the AFD, Alternative for Deutschland. In France, we've talked about uh, Le Pen in the past. Uh, she garners large support. Erdogan rules in Turkey. And it's not just Europe. In the context of India, Arundhati Roy says that the country is a dangerous place where a deeply flawed democracy has transitioned openly and brazenly into a criminal Hindu fascist enterprise. All this under Narendra Modi, who's promoting a Hindu supremacist ideology, targeting Muslims, Christians, and other minorities. So it's a, it's a pretty grim, no matter how you look at it, it's a pretty grim scenario out there. Have you, ever, have you noticed anything like this, historically speaking? Well, the 1930s not identical uh, there's nothing around right now like actual nazism which was uh, beyond the limits of violence and brutality but it's pretty harsh like modi's india now there's a lot of repression and violence and human rights violations but it's not hitler germany it's not Mussolini's Italy. It's bad enough, and it's moving in that direction. But uh, it's not that. Now, as they say, in the 1930s, there was one crucial difference, namely the United States, which, well, most of the, much of the world was descending into the fascist darkness. The United States was moving towards social democracy. The New Deal programs were not very, you know, not truly radical, but uh, they certainly were better in people's lives and offering hope. Business didn't like it. They were gearing up for an offensive to beat it back. Uh, I'm sure you remember Alex Carey's great book on taking the risk out of democracy, where he describes the business offensive of the 30s. The business press was, he quotes, was deeply concerned about what they called the rising political power of the masses. We have to beat it back. Began in the late 30s to try to organize efforts to beat it back. Put on hold under the war, right after the war, huge efforts by the organized US-led business community to uh, beat back this threat of the new of uh, popular democracy and social democracy it took some time a figure like say Dwight Eisenhower less authentic conservative in American political leadership was strongly supportive of the new deal of labor organizing and by today's standard, he sounds like a flaming radical. 
but the business world was at it. There were major efforts to beat back labor, uh, democratic efforts, uh, social democracy. Finally, they had an opportunity in the 1970s when there was an economic crisis and the business world seized the opportunity. You take a look at overall statistics in the United States, almost all mortality, healthcare, costs, incarceration, minimum wage. You see a point of inflection in the mid 70s. Uh, they were moving along, along with most of the rest of the developed world up to the mid 70s, and then it stops. The US moves off the spectrum in all these respects. Uh, by now, it's uh, uh, it was the late Carter regime, then Reagan took over and accelerated, opened all the spigots. Since then, that of course, same in England under Thatcher, spread all over the world. It's been a major class war, brutal class war, uh, which has devastated much of the world, uh, led to uh, the tremendous anger, uh, the resentment, uh, the contempt for institutions. Uh, uh, that's the background out of which you start getting these fascist, proto-fascist parties. No, it's not too late to reverse it, but there isn't a lot of time. That's certainly the view of uh, Antonio Guterres, the Secretary General of uh, the UN, who has been consistently uh, warning the planet, all of us, about the dangers uh, if we do not act and act very, very uh, soon. He's right. Unfortunately, not enough people are listening. I mean, there are people who are listening, young people, people in Extinction Rebellion, and Sunrise Movement, and the people who are out on the streets demonstrating, uh, carrying out civil disobedience, demanding that you do something. And they're, they don't have to listen, they know it themselves, and are desperately trying to get attention to the older sector, the population, those with political power, to do something to arrest this lunacy and to take advantage of the opportunities that we have uh, to move forward. Well, that's the struggle that's going on. There was some interesting uh, literature that also came out around the uh civil war in Spain in, in the 1930s, which you alluded to, which resulted in uh, Franco's ascendancy to, uh, to power. Um, Sinclair Lewis uh, wrote a novel, It Can't Happen Here. Um, uh, decades later, Philip Roth wrote a novel called The, the Plot Against America. Um, perhaps most famously in France, uh, Albert Camus' uh, La Peste, The, the Plague, uh, in which uh, was an allegory about the German occupation of France uh, using rats. It's, it's really interesting. I don't know if you've read that book or remember it, but it ends with the doctor warning the people who were out celebrating in the streets that the plague, they thought the plague had passed and would not come back again. And the doctor warns them that there's always a dormant bacillus that never dies or disappears for good, that it can lie dormant for years and years, that it bides its time, and that perhaps the day would come when it would rouse up its rats again and send them forth to die in a happy city. Do you remember reading Camus' The Plague? Well, unfortunately, there have been people with warning. And add Aldous Huxley, George Orwell, Zamyatin earlier, uh, but those are 
voices in the wilderness. Uh, we're kind of like uh, right now, the kind of image that comes to my mind is sort of imagine uh, some, somebody falling off a skyscraper. And as he passes floor after floor, there are arms reaching out saying, hold my arm, I'll pull you in and save you. And he keeps saying, don't worry, everything's fine. This is great fun. Uh, don't worry, that's us. I don't know if you can see this or not, but I'm holding up um, the cover of our new book, Notes on Resistance, a collection of uh, interviews that we've done over the last few years. Well, you mentioned uh, Extinction Rebellion and the Sunrise Movement as uh, points of resistance, but do they have uh, enough uh, power to really affect uh, change? And I'm, and I'm thinking of what happened in Sri Lanka in uh, July, where a popular uprising uh, literally overthrew the corrupt government of uh, Raja Pasca. Do you see that happening here? Are there ingredients for a, a revolt from the left, not from the right? Well, Sri Lanka was a very special situation. It was really a total disaster. Countries just collapsed. A uh, ton of corruption that had followed the uh, neoliberal prescriptions to the point of disaster. And of course, it had a huge civil war, which was devastating, never come. Uh, so it's at the edge. Is there any indication of a left uprising in the United States? Not that I can see. If there's an uprising in the United States, at least under current circumstances, it's much more likely to be from the far right, just like in Brazil. Uh, one of the things that Bolsonaro did in Brazil was to unleash a flood of weapons. Arms used to be pretty well controlled in Brazil. Just opened it up, make sure there's plenty of firearms around. It's not for fun. It's not for shooting uh, you know, rats. It's uh, for an uprising. In the United States, of course, it's overwhelming. And the Supreme Court is helping out recent, one of the recent Supreme Court decisions, Clarence Thomas, was to overturn a New York law from 1913, which required that if a person wants to carry a concealed weapon in New York, he has to have, provide some sort of reason for it, some justification. Thomas said, you can't have that. And what Thomas was, at, these aren't his words, but the import of his words, Thomas, is that this is such a hateful, awful, hideous country that people need the arms if they're going to take the subway or go to a store. That's what kind of a country this is. It's basically what he's saying. So you don't need any. Uh, you don't have to give a reason to control, to have a concealed weapon in New York or anywhere. You already have a reason. This country has fallen so low that you just can't be prepared to go out if you don't have arms and self-defense. That's kind of like uh, Cruz in Texas. It's a simple answer to the school shootings. Turn them into armed camps, you know, fortify them. Uh, have a marine battalion there, uh, teach the kids uh, how to uh, hide and hide, teach the teachers how to shoot. And that's the educational environment you need in the kind of hideous country that these people want to see in the United States. Well, that's the kind of right-wing uprising you're likely to get. The death of Queen Elizabeth on September 8th 
uh, generated days and days of wall-to-wall -wall media coverage. Imagine the impact on the public if the climate crisis received such attention, endless reports, it would sink into the consciousness of, of the people and then action could be taken. But it doesn't happen. We're distracted by distractions, as uh, Eliot used to say in one of his poems. Now, Unfortunately, that's true. I mean, you can put it more narrowly, take England. England is, well, England was spending huge amount of energy, time, and money, in fact, in the, the elaborate, carefully prepared uh, mourning ceremonies for Elizabeth. The country was practically collapsing. Just take a look at the currency. The British pound has reached the lowest level relative to the do dollar that it's ever had. There's an energy crisis coming along. People can't pay their bills. Uh, the the um, food banks can't take care of people. Country's falling apart. So let's uh, have an elaborate ceremony for the queen. It's not gonna survive like that. Uh, the new budget of the Tory, new Tory government, the Liz Trust government, was his proposal, tax cuts for the rich. I mean, you look around the world, this is when people can't find food, they can't, uh, can't pay their electric bills. Good, let's have a tax cut for the rich. And of course, there's tremendous inequality. I mean, it's, uh, it's hard to look at the things that are happening and think that there may be uh, some strange uh, poison has spread through the air, uh, turning humans into lunatics. But policymakers and so-called leaders are still very timid in their approach to addressing uh, societal problems and the questions of war and peace. With uh, where drastic and dramatic action is required, they're twiddling their thumbs and are content with half-hearted measures. Once again, the question comes up. The rulers and the mega... Once again, the question comes up. The rulers and the mega-rich have families, they have children and grandchildren, yet they fail to act to at least minimize the catastrophes which are sure to come. I know you've thought about this. Why does it happen? It's an interesting phenomenon. That's why I use the image of the guy falling off the skyscraper. Passes the 50th floor arms reaching out to help him. He says, don't worry, it's fun. I'm doing great. And in fact, the rich are doing great. They're so rich, they don't know what to do with their funds. I mean, how many super yachts can you have? So what's the fuss? Uh, uh, that's the mentality. Incidentally, it's not quite accurate to say they're just twiddling their thumbs. They're acting to make it worse, much worse. I gave a couple of examples. So let's use our science and technology to harden the permafrost so that we can extract more oil. Let's punish corporations that are informing stockholders of the environmental effect of their investments, so they won't do it. Let's take something more serious. Take Taiwan. Just think what's going on there. I mean, for 50 years, there's been peace concerning Taiwan. It's based on a policy called the One China Policy. The United States and China agree that China is that Taiwan is part of China, as it certainly is under international law. 
they agree on this. And then they add what they call strategic ambiguity, diplomatic term that means oh, we accept this in principle, but we're not going to make any moves to implement it. We'll just keep ambiguous and be careful not to provoke anything. So we'll let the situation ride this way. It's worked very well for 50 years. What's the United States doing right now? Not twiddling their thumbs. Now put aside Nancy Pelosi's ridiculous act of self-promotion. Now that was idiotic, but at least it passed. Much worse is happening. Take a look at the Senate Foreign Relations Committee. September 14th, they passed a Taiwan Policy Act, which totally undermines the strategic ambiguity, calls for the United States to treat to move to treat Taiwan as a non-NATO ally, otherwise very much like a NATO power, open up full diplomatic relations, just as with any sovereign state, uh, uh, move for large-scale weapons transfers, joint military maneuvers, interoperability of uh, weapons military systems, very similar to the policies of the last decade towards Ukraine, which were designed to integrate it into the NATO military command and make it a de facto NATO power. Well, we know where that led. Now they want to do the same with Taiwan. So far, China's been quiet about it. Uh, but can you think of anything more insane? Well, that passed. It was a bipartisan bill. Uh, there were a few people who voted against it. Four Democrats, one Republican voted against it. Basically an overwhelming bipartisan vote to try to find another way to destroy the world. Let's have a terminal war with China. It's coming to the Congress. Incidentally, there's almost no talk about it. Try to find a report somewhere. You can read about it in the Australian press. I'm pretty upset about it. I haven't even seen a word here. It's just coming up for uh, a vote. The Biden administration, to its credit, is opposed to it. Pentagon, I'm sure, is opposed to it. You must think it's insane. But it could pass. Well, then what? Not fiddling their thumbs, saying, let's race to the abyss as quickly as possible. But still, I'm thinking of that grandchild that says, Grandpa, why did you mess things up for me? Why did you ruin the planet? It's our only home. What will Grandpa be able to say? They're saying it. When Greta Thunberg gets up at the Davos meeting, it's exactly what she said. She said, you betrayed us. How do the elite react? polite applause, nice little girl, now go back to school, we'll take care of it. That's what grandpa is saying. Well, Biden on September 21st uh, addressed the, the UN in New York. I know you, you love irony and you like to use it a lot. Uh, Biden said, Russia has shamelessly violated the core tenets of the UN Charter. I don't know if you uh, heard his speech or not or read it, but- um, I didn't hear the, it, but I read it. The US has quite a record itself of uh, violating the core tenets of the UN Charter. But where is the media to point out these contradictions and hypocrisies? Well, there's plenty of response in the third world mostly collapsing in ridicule. You read third world commentary and hardly believe what's going on. Here's the leading 
violators of the UN Charter, way ahead of anyone else, telling us, oh, somebody violated the UN Charter. I mean, it's actually pretty wild when you look at it. I've been writing about it, it's almost hard to believe. It's a major article in Foreign Affairs, the major establishment journal, by uh, two liberals, Fiona Hill, who's high level political advisor, active in the uh, leading Russia specialist on the liberal side, Angela Stent. Uh, they have an article, of course, denouncing Putin, how awful he is, and then denouncing the third world. They say this crazy third world. There are people out there who actually dare to compare what Putin is doing in Ukraine with what the United States did in Vietnam and Iraq. How crazy can you be? I mean, it's as if they're living in some outer space somewhere. That's the liberal elite. You won't find one sort of criticism about that. Of course, I did. Maybe a couple other mad mavericks will do it. But there isn't going to be any criticism. Yeah, of course. How dare anyone compare Putin and Ukraine with our benign efforts destroying Ukraine, Vietnam, and Iraq? I mean, you see it everywhere. In Europe, uh, there's talk now about should we expel uh, Russia from the Security Council? Did anybody talk about expelling US and Britain out of from the Security Council after the invasion of Iraq? In fact, if you look back at the record on Vietnam, the UN was afraid even to discuss it because they understood that if they brought it up, the US would just destroy the UN. So you can't bring it up. Well, who can talk about this? I mean, that's the world we live in. It's the intellectual community we live in. I mean, to this day, decades later, you can't find anyone giving an honest, except way at the fringe, giving an honest critique of the Vietnam War. Try to find somebody in the mainstream who will say what, 70% of the American population said in 1975 that the Vietnam War is not a mistake. It was fundamentally wrong and immoral. Find somebody. That was 1975. I've been looking. The left wing in the establishment at the time, people like Anthony Lewis in the New York Times said the war was a began with blundering efforts to do good, but it turned into a mistake because we couldn't bring democracy to South Vietnam, to Vietnam at a cost acceptable to us. Meanwhile, 70% of the population are saying, not a mistake, fundamentally wrong and immoral. Well, take the present. See if you can find somebody in the mainstream who will criticize the Iraq war, criticize it, not just a strategic blunder like Obama praised for them, but what it was, a supreme international crime, a brutal, vicious crime and disaster. If I take a look at how we deal with these things, I don't know if you follow, we may have talked about this, stop me if we did, but on the 20th anniversary of the invasion of Afghanistan, another huge crime. Uh, there was actually one interview with George W. Bush in the Washington Post. It was in the style section of the Post. It was an interview of this, this goofy, lovely grandpa playing with his grandchildren, uh, having fun, showing off the portraits he 
painted of, of famous people he had met. Just a wonderful, lovely scene. After 20 years of destroying and devastating Afghanistan. Same with everything else. It's, uh, that's the intellectual climate and an intensive system of indoctrination tries with much success to impose it on the population. Meanwhile, we're doing the things I just described. And not just you and not just us. I mean, take one of the most comical scenes right now is what I described earlier. The squabble between Israel and Lebanon as to who will have the honor of submerging both countries under water. That's what the squabble is about. Is there any talk about it? No. Get an article in Haaret saying this is crazy, but uh, frankly, nothing. Well, Chile was an object and target of a U.S. intervention. Its democracy was overthrown in a CIA sponsored coup in 1973. But fast forwarding uh, to the present, they had, an, they had a vote on a new constitution. Uh, in Chile in early September. This was to replace the Pinochet dictatorship constitution, which had been enacted in 1980. The, the vote was 62% against uh, the new constitution. What was your understanding of that? And uh, what is your opinion of uh, the young Chilean president and former activist, uh, Gabriel Boric, who said he's going to uh, launch a, another campaign to get uh, a new constitution in place. There's more to the story. This was preceded by a referendum in which about 80% of the population said they wanted to get rid of the Pinochet constitution. So it's a mixed story. What happened? Well, you look closely, turns out People objected to this constitution. It had elements in it that people didn't like. But one element in it was to declare Chile to be a, a multinational society, give extensive rights to the indigenous population, which they should have. Well, that was too much for much of the population. Uh, they didn't want that. They wanted something that would replace the Pinochet dictatorship, but not things like that. Uh, it gave rights to nature. That's a very progressive idea. Too much for much of the population. There were also some, I should say, the Chilean media, all of them, are ultra-right. And they carried out a huge campaign of vilification of the constitution, the new constitution, uh, bringing all kind of lies and fabrications, saying all the terrible things it had in it. Well, there's some tests of whether that had an effect by accident, not by design. There were some virtually controlled experiments, uh, similar populations which differed in that one of them had actually seen the constitution and the other had only read the press about it. The differences were dramatic. The ones who had seen the constitution were much far more favorable. The ones who had only read about it were strongly opposed to it. We've seen things like that here. Uh, take the Build Back Better bill, the main Biden proposal. If you look at its individual elements, uh, the population was pretty strongly supportive of them. But if you look at the bill itself, population was opposed because they didn't know what was in it. They just don't want a big government program by these you know, Democrats who were trying to 
pour something down on our heads. Well, same kind of story. Uh, it's what happens when you have, uh, we've seen it over and over on things like healthcare, overwhelming public support, but then the business propaganda begins about how you're not going to be allowed to see your doctor, the government's going to tell you what drugs you're allowed to take, all kind of other scare stories, turns against it. That's what propaganda is for. That's what it means to have a highly class conscious business class, consciously, carefully, constantly carrying out bitter, savage class war with enormous resources, organizations, uh, dedication has this effect. Address, with just a few more minutes, okay, no? Okay, I should mention something else about Chile, that uh, overthrow of the Pinochet, of the, of the democratic government and installation of the dictatorship took place not just in 1973, but on 9-11-1973. That's the first 9-11, far worse, incomparably worse than what we call 9-11. Anybody talk about that? Talk about the old question of cosmetic reforms versus fundamental radical change. Uh, it's something that uh, Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. addressed when he said, and I'm quoting, for years I labored with the idea of reforming the existing institutions of the South. A little change here, a little change there. Now, he said, I feel quite differently. I think you've got to have a reconstruction of the entire society, a revolution of values. So talk about reform versus genuine radical change. Well, you can take this way back to Rosa Luxemburg, the leading left activists over a century ago. Uh, I've never really accepted that dichotomy. It's not reform or revolution. It's both. There are reforms that are very desirable. I say uh, a reform of the health system that would bring the United States into the world. I mean that literally. You go back to 19. 1975, the United States health system was pretty normal among advanced societies. Roughly the same outcomes, roughly the same costs. Then comes the split that comes along with neoliberalism. Now it's twice the costs of comparable societies, some of the worst outcomes. Uh, so even so extreme that mortality is increasing in the United States, it doesn't happen anywhere except for war, severe pestilence. But in the United States, it's happening alone. Well, I'd like to see a reform of that. I'd like to see the United States have a health system like other societies. That's nowhere near enough, but it's a significant reform saves many lives, saves infant lives, older people's lives. It means when you go to, it means you don't go bankrupt if you have to go to a hospital. I'm not against that reform, I'm for it. It's not, we also ought to have a major social revolution in which health is a right, a guaranteed right. You don't have to go through these hopes. So, but that's a major change. Uh, social, I'd like to see a social change in which workplaces are democratized, not tyrannies. Okay? But meanwhile, I'd like to see better protection for labor rights. Okay, those are not, those are not contradictory. 
Uh, those are steps you take to try to change the world. Improve it when you can. Try to overcome its fundamental problems by organizing committed revolutionary movements, not in conflict. But given the nature of existing institutions, you know, let's talk about the Congress specifically, where one senator, Joe Manchin, wields outsized power and is able to uh, block the legislation he doesn't support and pushes through things that he wants. How is that going to happen given the structure of the Congress? No, Joe Manchin was elected by 300,000 people, many of whom actually oppose his policies. Uh, you look at what's happening in West Virginia, uh, the United Mine Workers representing much of the working class in West Virginia, uh, they accepted a transition program which would move miners away from the collapsing coal industry to transition to training and jobs in renewable energy. Manchin's opposed. He wants to maintain the coal industry. He's a coal baron himself. It's funded by the coal industries. So he's pursuing policies which are harmful to West Virginia and which West Virginia voters uh, his own mining group or against. It's a, we have a very limited democracy. Uh, there are structural problems like the kind that allows somebody like Manchin even to have a voice. Uh, a lot of problems. Yes, they should all be overcome. You can, and we could spend the next couple hours on ways in which they could be overcome. But meanwhile, Let's try to make whatever small changes we can while working on these big ones. And I'm afraid I have How to about do. one plug for the book, Notes on Resistance? Okay, good. <laughs> Thanks very much for your time. Good to talk to you always. Take care. Hi, Valeria. Bye. Thanks, Noam. Bye.